Dumps it into Washington, left of the lane. Jump pass to the... What? Why would you shoot that? Come on. All right, who wants some of my famous Bow Buster nachos? Did you say Bow Buster? No game is complete without these bad boys. We got spicy Doritos, hot chili lime fried taquito shells, replace the nacho cheese with a healthy portion of buffalo sauce, jalapenos of course, other various hot sauces for a diverse spicy experience, and the secret weapon, top it off with some canned tuna. Tuna? Well, I'll just leave them here. Help yourself. So sometimes you just have to say, no, no. There's, just, there's moments in life, and yet we find it difficult, we find it challenging. Sometimes we find it so challenging is that we walk through life almost like we're walking through a buffet line, and opportunities come along, and situations come, and we say yes, and yes, and yes, and yes, and we get halfway down the buffet line of life and realize that our plate is overloaded, there's too much. As we began thinking about this last week, we discovered there's a point where your life is so full, your schedule is so full, your margin is so tapped that you get to a point where anything you say yes to is saying no to something else. We learned that every yes is a no. When your plate is full, if you say, boy, I've got all these things on my plate, you get to a point where you finally say, I can't, I can't slide one more thing onto my plate without something falling off the other side. Now, here's the problem with that. We who say, well, I have a hard time saying no, we say no all the time. It's just that we slip new things onto our plate and we don't notice the things falling off of our plate. And here's the dilemma. Oftentimes, those are the most important things in our lives. What falls off the plate? Our personal health. What falls off the plate? Our children. Our marriage. Our walk with Jesus. Things that we should be paying attention to get pushed off because we keep loading more and more things on. Every yes when your plate is full is a no to something because something falls off the plate. But we also are learning that every no, every time we say no thank you, no I don't need that, I'm saying no to that, every no becomes a yes because now I've got some room on my plate. I've got some room to put some other things on there. And I can say yes to the things that matter the most. And that's what God wants for us. God wants us to have these rich, wonderful, amazing lives, but oftentimes we load up our plate and our lives with things that just aren't as important. And so as I was thinking about this and as I was working on this book, No is a Beautiful Word, I ended up at Zondervan Publishing, the publisher that published the book, and they, they wanted to do some short little video pieces for promoting things online, promoting the book online. So I'm there with a camera guy and with kind of a director guy, and we're filming for a couple of hours, and we got done filming, and they were listening to the content of the book. They hadn't read the book, but these two guys are listening to all the stories about how to say no and why to say no and how saying no makes your life a better life and a freer life. So I finish, and the camera guy says, hey, hey, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He says, okay, here's the deal. I'm married. I love my wife. We have two kids. Love my kids. We have three dogs. Love my dogs. He said, but my wife wants another dog. And I don't. I think we have enough. What is he saying? I think our plate's full. And then he says to me, how do I tell her no? So I actually said, well, give me just a minute. I, went, I opened up a book, and there's a section called Know Your No's, and there's 20 different ways to say no. So I picked three of those no's, and I said, run your camera. He says, what do you mean? I said, just run it. Then you can have some extra footage, or you can just do this to remind yourself. Of what I, so I, I gave him, I said, I just talked like I was him talking to his wife. And I said no three different ways. And he said I could use any of those. I said, do it. So I thought we were done. But then the director guy goes, oh, oh, I got one. I got one. <laughs> See, we all have things we want to say no to. We're just trying to figure out how to do it. So the director guy goes, okay, so I got a church I go to. I love my church. And I got a pastor. I love my pastor. But when my pastor asks me to do things, I sort of feel like it's God asking me. He said, you know, he said how do I tell my pastor no? And I said, I can't be of any help to that. So, <laughs> no. <laughs> 
I didn't say that. I said, uh, I, I turned to that same section in the book and I picked out three different no's for him to, and I said, okay, here's how you say no to your pastor. And I walked and I said, film, they filmed that too. And I said, I walked through three different ways. He says, I can do that. We can say no, we just have to have a good menu of no's. We have to know our no's and know why it's important to say no in those difficult times. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter five. In Matthew chapter five, we have a record. It's actually Matthew chapter five, six, and seven. It's the most famous sermon in the history of the world given by Jesus. It's, he gives it on a hillside, and so it's called the Sermon on the Mount. And in this sermon, Jesus talks about saying yes and saying no. And he says something really important about when we say yes and when we say no. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew 5, 30, uh, 33 to 37. Jesus is speaking, and he says, Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. When you say you're going to do something, follow through on it. Verse 34, But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all. Don't say, oh, I swear, I swear. Nobody believes you. you have to go, oh, I swear. So they'll finally believe. He says, don't, even, don't swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne. Don't swear an oath by earth, for it is God's footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. And here's the key, verse 37. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. What's Jesus saying? He's saying we should be as good as our word. When you say yes, everyone who hears you says, oh, it's gonna happen because they know who you are. Your yes is a yes. And when you say no, people know it's a no. We can't manipulate and get them to flex on that. They've said no. Your yes is your yes. Your no is your no. And anything beyond that is sort of the enemy trying to get us to, get us, I gotta swear and I gotta promise because nobody really believes me. I, I have a guy I know well, and he's an interesting guy. He's, he's the president of a large institution, and um, for the last probably 10 years, whenever I'd see him, and I interact with him maybe once every couple of years, he'll say, oh, we got to bring you out to our institution. i got to have you speak and talk about this stuff. He said, I wanna, I'm going I'm to call you. We're going to have you come. And so I said, oh, great, wonderful. So I actually told my assistant, Ramel, I said, hey, contact this, this institution, check with the guy. He wants to have me come out and do something ministry-wise for them. Don't, they don't return the calls, never get back. And finally, my assistant said, I've tried like four times. I said, I guess it's not going to happen. No problem. Next time I see him, oh, oh, we got, we got to have you out. It's going to be great. We're going to bring you out. We're going to have you speak. And, and then nothing happens. By the third time I see this guy, and he says, oh, we got to have you out. What am I thinking? I think, it's not going to happen. I don't believe you. Because when you're with me, you have to say a certain thing. But when you're not there, you don't follow through. His yes is not his Yes. And what Jesus is saying is, you should know when you say yes that you mean it. So don't, so don't say yes. Don't, don't keep piling things on your plate that you can't do, and then you finally have to kind of flake out and not do it because you didn't think it through. Make sure your yes is yes and your no is no. Because, because that's the way that God wants us to live our lives. People should look at you and they should say, listen, when she says yes, I know it's a yes. When she says no, it's a no, because they follow through on their words. When he says yes, when, when he says no, I know it's going to happen or not happen, because they're as good as their words. So I have a question for you. And I want you just in your own heart to be honest for a moment. Do people believe you when you say yes and no? Do people believe you when you say yes and no? Do they know that your yes is yes and your no is no? Because they should. And that's what Jesus is calling us to do, is to make sure that we think about when we say yes. And Jesus is clear, when you say no, we say no, but mean it when you say it and follow through. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. If you're still in Matthew 6, just turn back a couple chapters there to Matthew chapter 4. And I want to talk about this idea that no, because it is written. We should say no at times because we know what this book says. When I became a follower of Jesus, I grew up in a non-church home. I didn't know what to say yes to and what to say no to because I didn't know the book. And you say, well, people just know what's right and wrong in this world. No, we don't. We don't. We have to learn. And so this book guides us. And so what I want you to notice is something in, in Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, we're going to walk through this passage. I want you to notice that, that the enemy, Satan, is tempting Jesus. And Jesus is God with us. The enemy is tempting Jesus. And every time Jesus says no, he says these words. It is written. All three times. 
Remember in biblical times, the way you emphasized something and made it as extreme as you could is you said it three times or you did it three times. This is being clear that when evil came three times, temptation came three times, Jesus responded the same way every time. He actually quoted from the fifth book of the Old Testament, the book of Deuteronomy. And he said, it is written, it is written, it is written. Follow along with me. Matthew 4, 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, gave him a food temptation. If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. But Jesus answered, read the next three words with me, you ready? It is written. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus quotes from the book of Deuteronomy. He says, the Bible says this, I'm standing on it. Verse five, then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand at the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. And then Satan misuses scripture. And Satan says, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up on their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Throw yourself down, because Satan says, because the angels will grab you and catch you before you hit the ground. But Jesus answered him, Read the next four words with me. You ready? It is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus quotes again from the book of Deuteronomy. Verse eight, round three. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. But Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan. Read the next four words with me, you ready? For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Over and over and over when the temptations come, Jesus says no, but he bases his no on something, on the word of God. We walk through our lives without an anchor, without a sense of what's right and wrong in our culture. And we need to know this book. We have to believe what this book says. For, for me, when I became a follower of Jesus, it was this book. When I started reading the Bible, I'd never held a Bible. I'd never read a Bible. I didn't know any Bible stories. Someone gave me a Bible. As I'm reading through it, I'm like, whoa, I got to stop doing that. Oh, that's wrong? Whoa. I mean, it was like, you know, 16 years old. Grew up in a non-believing home. And, and it was like, wow, there's some stuff I got to stop saying, start saying no to. And there's some stuff I got to start saying yes to. My life was all mixed up. But God's word is written and it leads us and it guides us. If you're a note taker, you can write this down. The power of scripture when we say no. The beauty of the Bible of scripture when we say no is this. There's three things I wanna just quickly mention. When I know the Bible, I know what to say no to. I, I, I learned what to say no to when I read the Bible. I didn't know and what to say yes to. But I know what to say no to because of the Bible. I have confidence when I say no. When I say no to something, I can be confident even if it's gonna be a tough road. And sometimes when we say no, it's a tough road. But I can be confident, why? Because it is written. And I know I'm standing on God's truth in a world that says there is no truth. Or every truth is just my own truth. Which is even worse than saying there is no truth. I'll just make up my own truth and live my truth. It doesn't work that way. The power of scripture when we say no is that I have power to say no and live with the consequences. I can say no and live with the consequences. And there are times when we say no to temptation or no to things that we shouldn't be doing, there's consequences. It's difficult and it's costly. When I was about 30 years ago, when I was just starting to get an opportunity to work in doing some writing for a Christian publisher, I had a meeting. My wife and I, Sherry, had a meeting at a Chili's restaurant for about two hours. And they, wanted, they, they had a leader of the publisher and a leader from this big ministry. And they wanted to bring this publisher and ministry together and take all these years of sermon material that they had from this ministry and make small group study guides. And I love Bible studies. So they said, would you and Sherry be willing to write these small group study guides? You take old preaching materials from different people. You shape it into a study guide. And as I'm listening, I'm kind of figuring out, well, about 30% of the work will be from the old sermons that somebody else preached. And about 70% of the work will be our work original writing. So at the end of the meeting, the person from the publisher says, now, would it be okay if on the books that we, there can be about 100 to 120 page books that we would be writing and creating, would it be okay if your name wasn't on it, but we just had the name of the person who did the sermon that you're taking the material from? It's called ghost writing, and it's a common practice in publishing. So would that be okay? And I sat there for a minute, and my wife never totally knows what I'm gonna say. Um, <laughs> because I tend to say what I think, and that's dangerous, but 
I, I just thought, sat there for a minute, and I said, I said, no, I'm not comfortable with that at all. And I said these words. I said, that's immoral. That's immoral. And this publisher guy goes, well, he said, that's a very common practice in publishing. I said, I didn't say it was in, uncommon. I said, it's immoral. It's wrong. I said, I said if, I turned in a pa- if I was a college student and I turned in a paper that was 70% somebody else's work and I didn't give them credit for it, I just put my name on it, I'd be thrown out of school. It's called plagiarism, right? It's not allowed. And so I said, no, no, I, I would not be comfortable doing that. Hit the pause button. I'll tell you how that story ends later. Um, <laughs> but, okay, so, so here's the question. What scripture do you need to commit to memory? I want to challenge every person here, young and old alike, every person online, every, every person in the family worship venue. I want to challenge you to memorize one passage of the Bible around an area that you need to say no. You, and I don't know what the area is for you, but so, so maybe you say, okay, my area is anger. I mean, I get really mad. I get I have this explosive anger, and I don't know when it's going to come up, and it's just there. I want you to find a Bible passage that talks about having a calm spirit, battling against anger, and commit it to memory. You know, put it in your phone, uh, put it on a sticker on your, on your mirror, put it on your refrigerator, put it you know, in a card in your pocket, your wallet, your purse, wherever, but put it somewhere you can read it until it's all the way in your mind. You say, well, where am I going to find Bible passages about overcoming anger? Here's how you find it. You open up your phone, your tablet, your computer, you open up Google, and you say, Bible passages about overcoming anger. <laughs> and you will have hundreds pop up. Seriously. Then you pick one that, not an easy one, but the one that like totally convicts you and it's totally like in your face. And you're like, man, this one makes me uncomfortable. Memorize that one. And the next time you feel anger starting to come up, you say this, it is written. And you quote that passage over and over and over again. And you say, God, give me power from your word to live the way I should. Maybe your challenge is dishonesty. Maybe you're being dishonest in the workplace, at your school, you're cheating on stuff at school. You can get away with it because you're really clever but you know it's wrong. Google Bible passages about dishonesty or becoming an honest person. You find a challenging, convicting one, you commit it to memory. Sexual sin, gossip, greed, whatever your thing is, I guarantee you there's a bunch of Bible verses about it. Find verses, pick one that really challenges you, one or two of them, commit it to memory, and every time that pops up again, you say, it is written. And like Jesus quoted from Deuteronomy, You quote that passage, and you stand on that passage, and you ask God for power and strength. So in those moments where you have to say no, it's not just that you just in every situation, it's like, this comes up, no, this comes up, no, this comes up, no, no, no. It's like, you can be more diplomatic than that. You can be be more thoughtful than that. So I want to give you you, uh, some of the 20 no's. That, that I think will help you. I'll give you a few of them to get you thinking about this. Here's, my, here's what I call the nuclear no. This is the biggest no I have. Okay, this is the massive, in a moment where somebody's asking you to do something illegal, immoral, totally against who you are, this is, this is the, my biggest no, and this is what I call it. It's no, never, I'm offended you asked, don't ever ask me again. That's pretty strong, isn't it? You like that? No, never, I'm offended you asked, don't ever ask me again. So when would you use something like that? Well, here's one time. I'm walking out of day one of my intermediate German class. I'm going to Orange Coast College right near Newport Beach in Southern California. And a lot of the young women in the class were clearly going to the beach after class because they were dressed in their beach clothes. Um, That's all I'll say. But they were very revealing. And so I'm walking out of this first day of class and this woman comes up to me I've never met before. She's a student in the class. And this is how she greets me. She comes up to me and she says, Herr Harney, I would like to have sex with you if you'd enjoy having sex with me. I never had that offer before, um, and um, I was younger and better looking than I am now, but still, um, I, I just stood there, and I'm like, I didn't, and so I, I said, this is what I said to her. I didn't use those words, but here's, here's the way I worded it. This is my nuclear no. I said, I said, no, I'm not interested in having sex with you. As a matter of fact, I have a girlfriend, and I don't have sex with her. And she looked at me in the book. I said, she looked at me like I had just said, I eat kittens as a delicacy. <laughs> Which I don't, I don't, it's a metaphor. But I said, she looked at me like, what's wrong with you? You know, are you crazy? And she said, why? I think she was asking why I don't actually have sex with my girlfriend. I said to her, actually, um, I'm kind of a new Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. And I said, I believe that he has a plan for our sexuality. If it's in a covenant of marriage, that's between a man and a woman, it's not with strangers. And I said, so I'm following that as the way I live my life. And guess who never asked me if I wanted to spend time with her again? (laughs) You know? But you all know the sad part. I'm pretty sure before the day was over, she asked somebody else. 
She was a broken person. And I don't want to contribute to that brokenness either. But sometimes you say, no, never. I'm offended you ask. Don't ever ask me again. For, for some of us, here, here, here's the question. Where do you need to speak a stronger and bolder no? For some of you, people ask you to do things you know that are wrong. And you're like, oh, you know, no, no thanks. Or, oh, I don't know. You know and you, you, you got to look and say, no, you know what? That's not who I am. That's not my character. And you don't ever have to ask me about that again. Because the answer is always going to be the same. The answer is no. There are times where you have to bring that strong of a no. But there's other kinds of no's. How about this one? No, can I tell you why? No, I can't, but let, but let me explain. You know, no, but, but let me explain. And then you kind of walk through the reason behind it. I gave that no probably two dozen times to people at Shoreline Church. Over a decade ago, I was coming to Shoreline, working with Howie Hugo and working with your church and with the leadership team and getting ready to transition. Howie was going to be leaving as the pastor. The church was looking for a new pastor. I was kind of helping the church in that process. And as I was doing that, people kept coming to me and saying, well, why don't you just become our pastor? And each time I'd say, no, let me tell you why. I'm working on this thing called organic outreach. I'm writing these books. I'm doing this study. And I really believe that this work needs to be done because I think it can impact, I thought it was going to impact thousands of churches. Now it's impacting tens of thousands of churches by God's grace in partnership with all of you. We're impacting churches all over the world. But I say, no, because I got to finish writing these books and, and I've got these other commitments, I have to say no. But I'm glad to help you and Howie and the church get ready for your transition. And then I come back six weeks later and, and do some more work. work and somebody else would say, oh, why don't you become the pastor? I said, well, no, but let me explain. And I explained it over and over and over again. Remember one time I was at Turtle Bay with Pastor Dennis, and Pastor Dennis said, you know, Kevin, I really think you should be open to, to, to being our pastor. And I'm not going to tell you whether or not I ended up taking the call eventually. I'll keep that secret. But, um, <laughs> but Pastor Dennis actually said to me, I, he said, I really think you should be open to it. And I said, well, I'm very open, but every time I pray about it, God's saying no because I have to finish this other work. Well, this went on for almost a year. And at the end of that year, I'd done most of that work, and then the door was open. But I remember when Pastor Dennis told me that, I said to him, you know, Dennis, Listen, I'm not going to do it because of these reasons. He said, okay, well, we'll be patient because you're going to come be our pastor. And I thought, well, good for you, Mr. Smarty Pants, who knows everything. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, and, and he was right, but it, it, was, it was a matter of God's timing. No, can I tell you why? And if you explain the why, it takes away the mystery for a lot of people. Here's another kind of no. They're what I call risky, hard, and dangerous no's. There are times when you're going to say no, and you're in a situation, and you look at it, and, and it is written, and you know in your life, and you're prayerful, and you think about your life, and you just go, I got to say no. And you say, this is going to cost. This is going to hurt. This is going to, this, this, they're not going to understand, or there's going to be a consequence. And sometimes that's the way it is. And for those of us that just can't handle that, we just keep saying yes and piling things on the plate. But there's times where you, you have to say no. I remember my wife, Sherry, when, she, when our boys were quite young, Sherry had a, her first opportunity to do a, like a major publishing project. And she was working, working out of the home, raising our three boys. And the largest Christian publisher in the world came to her and said, we got this major project. It's an entire devotional Bible. You'd be coming up with 365 devotionals and you'd be writing them or finding writers or you'd be finding classic pieces and you'd be doing this whole, and she was so excited about it. And it took months to negotiate and get it all ready. And they finally said, green light, you have it. Here's a contract, you get the project. And it was like the very first day of summer when they finally made that decision and gave her the contract. And our boys were out of school. It was summertime. The back lot line of our house that we lived in was a pond, open water. And one of our boys was just learning to swim, and one hadn't learned to swim at all yet. And Sherry had to go, okay, my boys and summer outdoors playing and having fun and their mom being available, or my boys trapped in the house as I write eight to 10 hours a day. And she came to me and she said, I think I have to say no. And she said, I think when I say no, I'll slam the door shut on any future projects with this publisher. But I think it's the right thing to do. I'll tell you how that story ends in a little bit also. But, but here's the question for you. What risk do you need to take? What is a risk that you say, well, but if I say no, there's, there's a risk, there's a consequence. Is there a risk you need to be willing to take? And if you believe it's the right no, take the risk. And does sometimes it end up bad and difficult and hard? Yes! Sometimes the end result is not, is not the perfect thing, but if you say no, and you should be saying no, it's the right decision, and the ultimate risk is not as bad as the risk you pay at that moment for the price of saying no. And so what risk do you need to take in your life? Here's another no. No, because I love you. I love you too much to say yes. Boy, parents dealing with, with kids with addictions... Man, there's some hard nose. I love you, but I can't keep helping you walk down that road. Man, that's hard. 
Uh, there, there's all kinds. Uh, uh, you know, a, a child, a little boy or girl comes to dad or mom and they say, oh, um, I, I, saw this, I saw this YouTube of people parachuting and para, paragliding. And it was really neat. I'm going to learn to do that. So I got my sheet from my bed. I'm going to go up on the roof and jump off with my sheet and float down to the ground. Would that be okay, dad? Would that be okay, mom? And you say... He said, well, of course, honey. I wouldn't want to squelch your creativity. No, 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 I love you. You're going to break your neck. Are you kidding me? You know, there, there, there's, there's times you say no because it's the loving thing to do. And, and so here's a question for you. What is a loving no you need to speak? What's a no you've been holding back on and not saying? But what you need to do is sit down with that person in that situation and say, listen, I love you, and I care about you, and I wish I could say yes to everything you want, but you know what? I have to say no, because I think the consequences are too big, and I think it's too dangerous, or whatever, they're, but because I love you, and are they going to totally understand why, that you truly love them because of your no? Maybe they will, maybe not. Here's what I find when I say no to people. About 80% of people are just pretty good with it. Oh, okay, fine, great. About 10% actually will say Wow, I really like the way you said no. What, what? And they'll ask, and I'll start talking about saying no more, and I'll talk to them about what we're talking about in these sermons. And about 10% get grouchy and cranky, and you don't like me anymore, and you don't love me, and if you love me, you let me manipulate your life and force you to do anything I want. And, you know, and, and about 10% of people get upset because they can't control you anymore. But you gotta choose to live with that if you wanna live fully the life that God would have you live. And ultimately, why are we saying no? We're saying no so I can say yes. We're saying no to certain things so I can say yes to other things that matter more. The very first church I pastored was, uh, was uh, Valley Community Drive-In Church, which became, it, it actually moved across the street and started a new, it, it closed down and started in a middle school. And uh, in, that, in that context, I met one of the leaders in the church, a guy named Walt and his wife, Patty, two of the nicest people I'd ever met in my life, really sweet, wonderful people, very generous, very kind people. And they actually were the first one that we let babysit our firstborn son, just became really good friends. But the first time I got invited over to their home, I was totally shocked because I pulled into their neighborhood. And, and here's the thing, Walt and Patty both worked for a massive um, defense technology company, and she actually did all the technical stuff on all the wiring and electrical work for the space shuttles. I mean, it was like super high tech, and I knew that they both had really good incomes. And so I drive into their neighborhood, they gave me the address, I drive in, and it's a trailer park. And I pull in to this little, nice, well-kept, two-wide trailer. Now, I'm embarrassed to say this, I was, I'm a young pastor at the time, I'm in my 20s, but I'm thinking to myself, why are they living Nothing wrong with living in a trailer park, but I'm looking going, they make, I just knew they made really good money. And I'm thinking they would live in a big, nice house. And, I, and so I walked into their place, and it was a really you know, cute little place, and they had one child, and they both worked full time. Their child was grown up. And so uh, I didn't ask, say anything for about three or four months, but finally I got to know Walt enough to where I finally had a one-on-one -on -one conversation. I said, Walt, can I ask you a really weird question? And he said, sure. I said, I said um, you, got, you and Patty make pretty good money. He says, oh yeah, we do really well. I said, so... Um, this may sound terrible, but what, why do you live so simply? Why don't you live like in a bigger, nicer house? And he just totally, sincerely, from the core of his heart, and this, this humbled me as a pastor. He said, oh, we decided years ago that we're gonna say no to almost every new thing we could do so we can give away more for the work of Jesus because that's what brings us the greatest joy. And I sat there as a pastor and I was humbled because I thought, I don't think that way. I always think, what's the next upgrade I can do to you know, maximize and leverage everything I have? But they, and I watched them for, for over 10 years say no, 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 so they could say yes, 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 yes to the things of God. They inspired me. When we say no, we can say yes to what matters most. Uh, the publisher that Sherry and I said no, we would not ghostwrite for um, and we would not write these study guides if they didn't put our name in it, came back about a month later and said, okay, here's what we'd like to do. On the cover of each of these studies, we'll put the name of the person who preached the sermon because they're big, famous pastors. And inside, we'll put their name and then in smaller print with Kevin and Sherry Harney. Is that good enough? I said, that's fine because it's honest. And I'm just looking for honesty. And we ended up writing, we've ended up writing over 100 studies in the last 30 years. And every one of them has our name in little print. <laughs> not as big as the other person but it doesn't matter because it says hey they were part of this when I said no to the woman outside my German class 
At the time I was memorizing 1 Peter, and in 1 Peter chapter one it says, be holy therefore as the Lord your God is holy. When I said no to her, I said yes to the God who is holy, 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 and wants me to live more like Jesus. I also said yes to the woman I would marry one day, Sherry. And I think I said yes to give me some dignity to this woman who was so broken she'd throw herself at the feet of any man. She didn't even know. Those no's are powerful yeses. When Sherry said no to the summer project that started the day summer began, they came back and said to her, well, Sherry, that's what we like about you. You have your priorities straight. And they said, can we hire someone to work with you and they'll do all the research and background and data entry and you just do the fun part of creating the writings and getting all the writings and we'll pay you the same and you can do less work. <laughs> Praise God for a yes. But it doesn't always work that way, but, but Sherry could never experience that incredible yes if she hadn't said no and taken the risk. Right? When I said no to Shoreline about two dozen times over those, that year, I got to say yes at the right timing. And I, I love this church. And the work I did that year in getting all this stuff together for organic outreach, we now together as a congregation are sharing around the globe. We heard a pastor here a week or two ago say that he's trained, what was it, 350 or 650 pastors in India that no allowed us as a church to train him so he could train 650 people. I thank God for so many of the no's that I've said because they unleash a better yes for the glory of God. And so, Lord, we pray that you'll help us to have wise minds that say no to certain things, even to good, wonderful things that aren't the right things for us so we can say yes to what matters most. And now, Lord, I pray in these moments as we close, in this quiet moment of reflection, would you speak to our hearts about what we need to surrender, what we need to say no to. Speak to our hearts.